All right. Oh, well, welcome, welcome to, to the Ask Me Ask Me Anything session, and you, of course, you've missed the best bit, uh, which yeah. we've just had. Sorry about that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> where Simon basically said, instead of asking your questions, let me just do a very spectacular introduction, which I'm more than happy for him to do. So what we're going to do on this session is Simon's going to do a, a number of introduction to mapping, then there's some amazing topics that he wants to cover. And then when we have time at the end, I have a bunch of questions or maybe a couple of questions will turn up during the session. And, uh, and also there's already a number of videos out there on the Open Security Summit about mapping. Simon already gave a couple on them last uh, Open Security Summit. And also we're now going to want to do this every every month. So again, Simon, let me know what slots you got in January, the second week. And then we, we kind of do a regular um, occurrence. And I, actually, I think some of the questions I had might have to go to January. But over to you, Simon. You can start with the introduction. Do you to keep on jumping this stuff on me, don't you? Oh, we're going to do this every month, are we? Yeah. <laughs> well, the Sorry. summit, right? We, we, we do the we... summit every month. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we've just been having a lot of fun, actually. So, um, yeah. uh, and uh, you know, there, there's a lesson. Arrived to the Zoom Zoom thing early, and you would have got the uh, the pre meeting recorded meeting discussion. So, so how many questions do you actually have um, in total? I have a good amount, but don't worry. Go go for your for your presentation first. Presentation first, okay. Well, what we can do, uh, I assume that okay. Several people in the uh, audience here know how to map. There will be people out there who don't. So what I've got is some basics, which will go through the origin of maps, and then we've got a whole bunch of things on like getting started, and then we get into more sort of interesting areas like the innovate, leverage, commoditize model, industrialization, the impact of that, how it changes practice. That's great for knowing why you shouldn't be doing Kubernetes. Uh, just a point to you. Uh, Pioneer Settler Town Planner, uh, which is an organizational structural model, which uh, uh, requires a whole bunch of things like doctrine. And then digital sovereignty, which is, uh, you know, another great, uh, I do a lot of nation state competition stuff. And, uh, and that's an interesting space, uh, particularly because most people when they're talking about digital sovereignty, uh, are just talking endless stories with no understanding of the landscape. It's a bit, a bit like, um, physical sovereignty you've got to know where your borders are you've got to know the landscape and if you don't well good luck i suppose um all right so let, let's let's share a slide do, 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 do. screen two there's all the exciting things that uh, uh we can talk about and of course um we can throw in questions whenever you want sir and um, um we'll start with the basics i suppose Oh, roughly 35 minutes basics, five minutes getting started, five minutes ILC, 30 minutes industrialization, 15 minutes, well, you can read the numbers. Uh, um, so it's geared up to take up the whole two hours because I hate answering questions. Um, <laughs> but, but obviously the entire purpose of this is to answer questions. So I'll get through the beginning. Fair enough. All right, so basics. I'm gonna talk about the issue of strategy and we'll get onto maps. We'll get onto track by context and then some very basics of patterns. And that should be enough uh, to help for the rest. So this will start with the company. Uh, I used to work at this company called Fatango, um, about 16 different lines of business, uh, very profitable, revenue growing, uh, doing very well. I had a problem though. And that problem um, was the CEO. Uh, the CEO is what we would call a fake CEO. They were making it up as they went along. I uh, didn't have a clue uh, what they were doing. And I know this because I was the CEO. So um, I used to come up with these wonderful statements, uh, things like Fatango 2003, our strategy is customer focus. We will lead an innovative effort in the market through our use of agile techniques and open source. Uh, um, it's pure gibberish. I just pinched it from another company and changed a few words. I hadn't got a clue what I was doing. We were heavy users of extreme programming. And we were heavy users of Perl, providing both uh, um, and development of the language itself, uh, as well as open source modules. But this was literally pinched from another company, a few words changed. Uh, so I used to go around recording other CEOs talking about strategy. I'd look for the common words. I called them uh, uh, business level abstractions of a healthy strategy or blast for short. I've done this several years in a row. Well, so, uh, many times over the years, sorry. Uh, this was actually, this was about 2014. Common blast, digital business, big data, disruptive, innovative, collaborative, competitive advantage, ecosystem, blah, blah, blah. These are the words you would have heard. If you did it today, 
you'd hear, I don't know, AI, blockchain, digital transformation. It's going to be things like that. And so what I also did was grab a whole bunch of companies, sort of vision statements, strategy documents, and created a blah template. <coughs> so our strategy is blah. We will lead a blah effort of the market through our use of blah and blah to build a blah. And then I just smashed the two together and also generated, you know, random strategies, things like this. Our strategy is innovative digital business. We will lead a growth effort of the market uh, through our use of customer focus, competitive advantage and disruptives. I mean, it's pure gibberish. Um, but I, I, I would send them around. And I think the last time I actually sent them around was probably about 2014. Um, that's the last time I did this as a big exercise. And I got about 400 responses. And there were about three basic types. Um, those types were, um, uh, this is more or less the exact wording from our business plan. Uh, I've used two of these already. And the third, my favorite was, are you for hire? So, so a friend of mine has put this all online. And this is strategy as a service. Um, so if you ever need a strategy, you just type in the URL at the bottom. It will, it will create you one based upon nothing whatsoever. Uh, if you want to feel better about it, you can pretend that there's AI and blockchain and whatever else, you know, it's cloudy based. There we are, digital transformation. Um, uh, that, but, but it's just smashing words into a template, that's all. And if you don't like it, it's really simple, just press refresh and keep on going until you find one you do like. So our strategy is collaborative. We will lead an open effort of the market through our use of big data and social media to build digital business, pure gibberish. Anyway, so that's, that's where I was uh, probably about 2004, 2005. I decided, and I, I've just seen this problem going on. So I started to suspect I wasn't the only person in the world who didn't know what I was doing. Um, that there could be others. So I went to this, I, I read everything I could find on strategy. It was getting nowhere. And I was in this bookshop and the bookseller said, um, uh, and she, she asked me whether I'd ever read the Sun Tzu, The Art of War. And the answer is I hadn't. And so she recommended I buy two copies um, because they're uh, different versions because they're all translations. And I'm so grateful for that. Uh, because it was in reading the second version, I noticed a particular pattern. So Sun Tzu talked about five factors which mattered in competition. Uh, roughly speaking, uh, they're your purpose, your moral imperative. Secondly, understand the landscape in which you're competing in. Thirdly, understand the climactic patterns so how the landscape is changing. Uh, fourthly, understand doctrine. So these are the principles of how you operate. Uh, and lastly, you're into the leadership. So those are the five factors, purpose, landscape, climate, doctrine, leadership. And then I came across John Boyd, US Air Force pilot, came up with the OODA loop. Uh, the first O of the OODA loop is to observe the space. That's what landscape and climatic patterns are about. Then you orientate yourself around the space um, with uh, principles. And then you decide where you're going to attack. And this is where things like the leadership, your gameplay comes into, into, into play. And then you act. And um, at the heart of this are two whys. Uh, the why of purpose, your moral imperative, and then the why of movement. Uh, why make this choice over that choice? Okay. So if you think about a game of chess, why of purpose is win, why of movement is do I move this piece or that piece? And it's a cycle. And as you go around the cycle, of course, when you act, it might change your purpose. It will definitely change the landscape, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the more you do it, the better you get at the game. So I was quite pleased with this, uh, but that got me to think about landscape. So I started diving into all sorts of military history. Uh, and this is um, Themistocles, ancient politician, Greek general. Military, we use an awful lot of maps, um, um, but we also learn from them. So uh, Persians are invading, uh, had choices, decided to block off the Straits of Artemisium, force the Persians along into a coastal road uh, where there's a narrow pass known as Thermopylae. Small number of troops could defend against a larger force. There are about 4,000 Greeks, including 300 Spartans. That's where we get the story of the 300 from against this huge force. Now I started looking at how I was making decisions. Um, and I was using things like SWATs. So I do a SWAT for Themistocles. So here's my SWAT. Uh, strengths of well-trained Spartan army, a high level of motivation not to become a Persian slave, 
weaknesses, the E4s might stop the Spartans turning up. A truckload of Persians are turning up. Opportunities, get rid of the Persians, get rid of the Spartans. We're Athenian, we actually hate the Spartans. And threats, the Persians get rid of us. And the Oracle says a really dodgy film might be produced a few thousand years later. And the point about this is then I just simply looked at this and asked myself the question, what would you use to communicate and determine strategy in battle? Position and movement on a map? where you can discuss about where troops need to go, et cetera, or some sort of magic framework like a SWOT. And to my horror, uh, what I was using, um, I felt was SWOTs. And so I started getting, look, I really, really need some maps. So maps became sort of this big thing for me. This must have been very early 2005. It was like, ah, oh. and I started looking around. I thought, oh, I've got loads of maps. It's great. I've got things like uh, systems maps, I've got my maps, I've got, I had other things called strategy maps, I had business process maps, loads of maps. And then I started looking at these maps and this was one for a, a online photo service, different components. I took one component, CRM, and just simply moved it. And I asked myself, well, has the map changed? And the answer was, well, it hasn't. But if I take a geographical map and I move, say, take Australia and move it next to England, does that change the geographic map? Yes. So why hasn't it changed the map here? And the answer is because it's not a map, it's a graph. And in fact, everything I found up until that point in business, which called itself a map, was in fact a graph. So to understand the difference, um, the three diagrams at the top are all graphs and they're identical. Uh, Nottingham, London, Dover, Nottingham, London, Dover, Nottingham, London, Dover, connected by two roads, M1, M2. The three diagrams at the bottom, they're all maps and they're all different. And the difference between a map and a graph is simply that space has meaning because you're mapping a territory. There is meaning to the space. It's not nothing. Okay. Um, so the, the one at the top, I can move things. And it doesn't change the meaning of the graph. But the one at the bottom, as soon as I move something, it changes the meaning of the map. So there are three characteristics in order to give that you need to give that space meaning. First, you need some sort of anchor, say magnetic north is uh, using geographic maps. You need position of pieces. Uh, this is north, south, east, of west of that. And you need also consistency of movement. So if I'm going north, I'm going north. I'm not going south. If I'm going east, I'm going east, I'm not going, you know, west. So if you've got anchor position and movement, and you've got a landscape you're trying to map, then you can map out the space. So that's what I started with. And I always use this example of a tea shop. I started off thinking about a cup of tea, thought, right, what's the anchor? I'm going to take the anchor as being the public who consume cups of tea. Well, there's also the business. Okay, so they have a need to sell cups of tea. There's also regulators, etc. But we'll stick with those two anchors, the public and the business. They both have a need, one to drink and one to sell cups of tea, hopefully. But a cup of tea needs things as well. So it needs tea cup, hot water, it need, uh, hot water needs kettle, cold water, kettle needs power. So what you can do is describe a chain of needs. And this gives you position. Um, via basically visibility. So what I mean by that is when you're a consumer of a cup of tea, down the chain, it definitely needs power, but that's very far removed from you. It's not very visible to you. You don't go into a tea shop worrying about, you know, what power are they using generally? Um, that, that's quite distant from you. You can make it more visible by, you know, talking about things like uh, social responsibility, environmental responsibility. You can create a shorter chain, but in the normal chain, it's quite distant from you. And distance is, a, yeah, it's le less visible. So less visible distance, they're metaphors. So you can create a chain of needs and now you've got position on the base, on the idea of visibility. And it turns out all these things um, which we're drawing in this chain of needs are, are forms of capital. It doesn't matter whether activities, activities, practices, data, knowledge, even values, ethical values, they all evolve. And they evolve through common stages, one, two, three, and four, um, but that's not very meaningful. Uh, so what I do is I put labels down, um, genesis, custom, product, commodity. And so now what we've got is an understanding of, you know, not only what, what we're doing, but where things are. 
uh, it's not enough just to do the value chain. Um, because if you think about a kettle, a uh, custom built kettle is very different from a, from a um, commodity kettle. Um, same with a toaster. And uh, if you've never watched the toaster project, by the way, uh, Thomas Thwaite, Royal College of Arts, totally recommend it. Okay, so the point about this map is other people can look at it and say you're missing things, you're missing staff, and somebody can come along and say oh, all staff, they should be robots, okay. Um, somebody else can come along and say each of these nodes are stocks of capital and each of the lines are flows so we can put financial figures on there. Somebody can ask why aren't we using standard kettles, why are we custom building? Somebody might go brand exclusivity, uh, there's something special about, you know, use of custom kettles. Um, but the point about this, it doesn't matter who we are, we have now a common language which we can discuss uh, an environment about. So I, I'll show you a couple of examples too. Um, uh, I call these trapped by context. So a very simple example, insurance company, um, they needed compute. This is quite old. Uh, they would order server. Server goes into goods here, modify mountain racket. That's how they got more compute in their data centers. And um, they had a bottleneck to do with modification of the servers. Now, they'd spent about six months looking at this problem, come up with a plan on using robotics. They were going to spend several million doing this. Wonderful business case, return on investment calculations, all that sort of stuff. Great, looks brilliant. The biggest problem is you can't go in and say, why are you using robots as well? Because it will cause a fight. And the reason why it will cause a fight is because they have all these artifacts, um, uh, return investment, financial analysis, competitor analysis, but this is part of a narrative. And one thing that we tell people is that great leaders are great storytellers. And so we always say to people, you know, uh, your idea didn't succeed because you didn't sell it in the right way. You didn't present it in the right way. And the problem with that, it means when you challenge somebody's story, you're challenging the person. So it becomes highly political very, very quickly. So I couldn't get, just go in and say, why are you doing robotics? I asked them, draw me a map. 15 minutes later, that's the map they drew. User needs compute. They put compute in product. Uh, it was 2011, 12, so I would disagree, but it's okay. Um, order server, server goods in. And then they went right, mount modify. And I was able to look at this map and just get asked them a question. Why have you got rack and custom built? It turned out they had custom built racks. So I was saying, what are the modifications you're making to service? Well, they don't fit our racks. So we have to take cases off them, drill new holes, add new plates in order to get them to fit our racks. And at that point, of course, somebody in the room just went, why aren't we using standard racks? And the reason for this is, is you know, because then we don't have to do the robotics. We don't have to do the modification. And the reason why people, don't is they get trapped by context, trapped by the past stories. They're not daft, it's just this is the way we've done things. And so this is probably the single most common problem I see. People optimizing process flow and ignoring evolutionary flow. So they take pre-existing systems, they're constantly trying to make them more efficient, and ignoring the fact that these, this stuff has evolved. It's billions and billions get wasted in this. It's quite fun. All right, so, um, I'll give you another quick example, HS2, high speed rail, uh, James Finley. So they decided to build HS2 in a virtual uh, world uh, because uh, it's cheaper to dig up a virtual world and go, whoops, we've got that wrong uh, than it is the actual English countryside. So they decided to build the whole lot in a virtual world. That's their systems diagram, uh, the different components they need, it's a graph. Uh, and James's problem was this. Which bits do I outsource? Which bits do I use off the shelf products? Which bits do I use in house? Now, those three questions give you 387 million possible permutations uh, with that diagram. So which one do I choose? So the normal thing, what we do in government is uh, we tend to do this. Let's outsource the whole lot and then we'll group it into lots based upon that sounds similar. So we get basically lot one engineering, lot three back office, lot four infrastructure, lot two user experience. That's how people normally do it. But James decided to sit down and draw a map. So he drew, it took him an afternoon, uh, having a cup of tea on a Sunday, drew a basic map, sent it to me. 
and said, um, what do you think? And so I did a few modifications and I said, well, this is quite easy now. And it's easy because one of the things we'd learned back in uh, when I first started mapping about 2005, 2006, is that um, there's no such thing as one size fits all methods. So agile extreme programming, very good on the left hand side in the uncharted space, very lightweight XP, uh, because it's all about reducing the cost of change. Whereas Six Sigma, very good on the right hand side, it's about reducing deviation, lean, so it's, um, you know, Scrum, MVP, all those other artifacts, uh, very good in the middle, because it's all about reducing uh, waste and learning. So we just take that and apply it, use appropriate methods. So we say outsource the stuff over here, off the shelf, agile in-house. And of course, mindful of the fact that things will evolve over time as well. So that's what James did and it ended up in front of the Public Accounts Committee being praised for being way under budget and way ahead of schedule. She was like, fantastic. Now, what would have happened if we'd done the normal sort of let's outsource it all, break it into lot structures approach? Well, pretty simple. I'll show you in mapping form. Let's take a map. Let's um, mark it all, all as outsourced, the whole lot. Let's take one of those structures. We'll take the lot one engineering. And what you should be able to see is obviously that some bits are on the right, some bits are on the left. And that's a problem. It's a problem because when we specify in a contract, the stuff on the right can be specified. And so we can not only specify it, vendors can deliver what we've specified and so it will be efficiently treated. That's the stuff on the right. The stuff on the left, we can't specify. We don't really know what we want. We've got to learn about it. So if you try and specify it, you're always going to incur excessive change control costs. Um, you'll get into a fight with the vendor. The vendor will be able to say it's all your fault because you didn't know what you want. Pretty basic. All right, so we've done strategy maps, trapped by context, very quick into patterns. Three basic patterns, uh, climactic patterns. These are the rules of the game. These are what are gonna change your landscape whether you like it or not, but they're useful for anticipation. Uh, another set of patterns are doctrine. Uh, so these are universally useful principles for operating. Uh, another set of patterns are gameplay. Uh, so that's on the leadership side. These are context specific. So you've got about 30 climactic patterns, 40 patterns of doctrine, about 100 different ways of doing gameplay. Most people are oblivious to all of this, which is great fun. So we'll take a very simple chain and just go through some basic patterns. User needs an application based upon best coding practice on a runtime, on an operating system, best architectural practice on compute. This is probably where the compute industry was circa 2005, 2004. Okay. First pattern you learn is everything evolves if there's supply and demand competition. So we knew utility compute was coming towards us. Of course, past success breeds inertia. There's about 16 different forms of inertia, uh, pre-existing capital, um, uh, political uh, capital, as well as physical capital, existing governance practices. So if you had a big data center, uh, et cetera, and you didn't, you were in charge of it and you'd invested huge amounts of money, then a cloud was like, oh, you know, uh, you've got all the past success point to it. You're, you generally tend to be fairly dismissive of more utility environments. And that's all perfectly normal. Next pattern you see is co-evolution. So as things evolve, you also get new sets of practices. Uh, so with compute, we go from low, well, high MTTR, high mean time to recovery, i.e. weeks to get new machines. So we've got things like uh, scale up, M plus one, uh, disaster recovery test. You end up with more lower MTTR in the utility. So you get distributed systems designed for failure, chaos engines. Um, so you get a new sort of emerging practice, which speeds up the way we do stuff. Eventually we give it a name, we call it DevOps, by the way. Um, efficiency also enables innovation. So um, things like things like Netflix uh, were enabled. Um, actually Netflix Blockbuster is a really interesting one because uh, Blockbuster out innovated everyone. First with website, first with web ordering online, first with video streaming experiments. But it was a prime example of inertia because of pre-existing success, basically late fees. So despite the fact it out-innovated everyone, it, its inertia 
and it caused it to go bankrupt. So anyway, efficiency enables innovation and um, those higher order systems create new sources of value or wealth. So it doesn't matter whether we're talking about computers or electricity, electricity enabling things like Hollywood, you know, or, uh, radio and all that sort of stuff as well, it creates new industries. And this is useful from my point of view um, because it gives us an idea of where to invest. Where do I want to target? Target here. And it also tells me where not to target. Don't target when you're stuck behind the inertia barriers. Pretty straightforward. And so that's using maps is how with Ubuntu, uh, we were about 3% of the operating system market against Red Hat, Windows, uh, Microsoft. Um, it took us 18 months, cost half a million. We took 70% of cloud. It was really simple. During 2008, 2010, we just used the maps to work out where we need to attack. Um, emerging practice, of course, eventually Andy Patrick gave it a name, DevOps, there you are, it's evolving. Uh, best architectural practice for the product world is now called legacy, by the way. Uh, nowadays, runtime shifting towards serverless. So starting 2014, six years ago, AWS Lambda. I mean, there's previous earlier efforts, but that's where we can say it really kicked off. And what we're getting, of course, is new emerging practice, both in security, both in uh, um, monitoring capital flow in applications and new needs being created. So, so that's the sort of new future. And of course, all the stuff down over there is now then heading towards the new legacy. And the point about this is strategy is iterative. If, you, if it was 2010 and you were saying to me, oh, we're gonna go DevOps and everything and infra infrastructure service, yep, yeah, spot on. Uh, it's 2020 now. So the focus needs to be up the stack, okay? Very much on that serverless space and those new practices that are emerging. Um, I mean, some of these big companies will take, oh, well, Netflix took seven years to get rid of its data centers. So assuming you're as fast as Netflix and you can get it all done in seven years, which to be honest, most people aren't, uh, by the time you actually get there, you'll have just built a new legacy. So better to move up the stack now. Uh, final comments. Um, landscapes are all about the environment. They don't tell you what to do. They just show you a space. To work out what to do, you need to apply thought to it. Uh, use them lots in government. Um, and Liam Maxwell, uh, we used to go around with these stickers, what is the user need, great. Um, a particular project, 425 million, I mean, we say billions. Um, so they've been used in government a lot. Um, I, I like them when they uh, used for things like this, RNL, RNLI, this is James Finley again, using mapping there to reduce call out time because that saves lives. Money's great, but saving lives is even better. Um, it's being used in different places of the world. I know it's being taught uh, in places like Moscow Institute of Technology, Peking, Harvard, Kennedy. Um, it's being used by venture capitalists, uh, this is Becca in India. Uh, where they're using mapping for all their startups. Uh, it's starting to appear in all sorts of books. So AWS, second ever book, as far as I'm, I know, is Reaching Cloud Velocity. That's a book they've written themselves. Um, you'll find about 15, 16 pages of mapping in there, including the whole ILC model, which is great. Uh, Punch of Scrove, Tao Klein, science fiction book. Um, uh, that was actually written with mapping. Uh, UN Global Handbook. I mean, I've got a collection of books now, all with mapping in there. Uh, so it's spread all over the place because uh, it's all Creative Commons. So Strachey, Matt. Oh. This. oh, yes, you're yes, yeah, the Art of Strachey as well, Eric's book. So, um, oh, I, 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 I will start getting the collection. Who's got the bigger collection of books with? <laughs> no, no, I've got several. <laughs> I got the other one. I, just, I literally got the other one. Um, Actually, the one I, I, with all, I, all, your, all your thing, all your, all your medium posts. I, I got sent this one as well. This is from Intention to Action, a plan for digitalization oh, okay. of Puerto Rico. And I was like, why well, have I got this? And so I go in there and I start reading it. And uh, Municipality of Calgas, they've got maps. Those are maps. It's just <laughs> like, wow, it's fantastic. So I love that. But the one I really want to get into is this one. Oh, this, uh, this is your medium post, right? And it's. It's actually, I actually prefer to consume it like this than your, on digital. So yeah, I'm looking forward to rereading some of this stuff again. 
Well, I, so um, uh, Mark and uh, Giacatti said, do, do, you, do I mind? And I said, it's all yeah. Creative Commons, help yourself. So yeah, I'm exactly. delighted. Um, so, um, so we signed off with Strashy, how I knew now. Um, got into maps, that's where I started. It's all Creative Commons, help yourself. Um, one of the big, biggest problems is people are trapped by context and the stories and narrative we tell each other. Uh, one of the beauties about maps is you can get that story on a map and you can challenge the map without challenging the person. So I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying the map's wrong. It's rather sneaky, but it works. And uh, then you start getting into patterns. Um, I suppose that's it. That's my introduction done. Hang on. Uh, and so we've got loads of other choices. Getting started, ILC, industrialization, whatever you wish, or we can do some questions. No, keep going. I really want to get into the ILC industrialization, so keep going. Okay. Shall we ask the audience? They, they might yeah, have burning yeah, yeah. questions. <laughs> Any burning questions so far? I I just have one question. Uh, hi. Hi. <laughs> so my question is, how in what setting is it the first time that you presented a map to your company? Um, and how was it received? the first time that you know that it came out like was there any resistance to it or was it just like everyone was really happy i just want to kind of know the context wow. of like when it came out what happened then and how did you actually pitch it in well i didn't need to pitch it well okay so the pitch you mean pitching it to the rest of the company yeah exactly because exactly. I, I i didn't need to sell the ceo because i was the ceo so that was one big advantage wow. uh is, is that um so I, I sat there with um a good friend of mine uh who uh works for a company called stance uh and um uh james duncan so he uh, he also used to uh we both worked together for tango and um so um, uh, we sat in the boardroom and I started drawing up this map thing uh, and um, we just started talking more and more and more about it. So um, I found uh, my immediate reaction, obviously, with James is James understood what I was trying to say and I understood what he was trying to say and we could do it over the map. So uh, my, my initial reaction was, was positive. Um, did I heavily use it throughout the company? So here's the, here's the dumb thing. I sort of assumed everybody else in the world had maps. It was just I hadn't done a business school or I hadn't gone and done the MBA. And so obviously you went to a business school and they taught you about how to do strategy properly, which obviously means understanding your landscape because you obviously you want to, you know, look before you leap, you know? So I assumed everybody else in the world uh, knew how to map. It was just me who didn't. And therefore, I had to create my cheap and cheerful way of doing mapping because I hadn't bothered to pay to do an MBA. Um, so I, I used to use it in Patango in the board and everything else. And I used to use it sort of in discussions. But I think it took me another six years, even though I was presenting and using it, because when I used to present, it was like, oh, somebody's going to say, you know what you're doing, you're doing this and your, your method's rubbish. And uh, so I, I used to present it. It took me about another six years to realize other people weren't mapping. It was a bit of a shock, actually. Um, so I suppose the first six years, I just used it, would sit down, would spend my time explaining people. Sometimes they didn't understand, and I would think, oh. Um, and I could never work out how they did it at business schools, because they obviously were teaching people how to map, and uh, because they're a critical thing to do. And uh, so it took another six years before I realized they weren't, and it was all bloody stories. <laughs> <laughs> which was hilarious <laughs> so um yeah how was it received um it helps in the conversations i i like using it um so the interesting one even at uh so it was great at ubuntu actually so we were trying to deal with the whole cloud space that i was because that i suppose the second heavy outing and i still hadn't realized then that people weren't mapping and I would draw it up and I use that to explain to Mark and to others where we should attack and people got it. Um, I suppose it wasn't until three years after Ubuntu when I was in government and doing some stuff in government and I helped write the better for less and we had a problem and I drew it out of the problem on a map and said, this is the problem. And it was Liam actually, who's a good friend of mine. Liam said to me, that's great. I really understand that. What do you call that thing? And I went, what, the map? 
yes, that map, that's great. I've never seen one of those before. And I was like, really? Surely. And then I asked uh, a friend of mine who was also teaching a, 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 a business school. I said, uh, what, are you, what are you using for maps? And, he, and I showed him and he was like, that's brilliant. No, we don't have those. And then I would ask more and more CEOs. And it was like, no, I've never seen it. And at that point, it dawned on me. Um, beforehand, I'd just been bumbling along using. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, it does. <laughs> So, 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 since you touched those two topics, I actually had two questions on it, right? So, the first one is on Ubuntu. Yeah. Can you expand a little bit of what you actually did, right? Because I know you guys went from, you know, 3% to 60%. In practice, what was the movements and what was the pieces that you saw that, and then the actions that you guys did at the time? Well, so, so the first, when I, when I first arrived at uh, uh, Ubuntu, it was quite interesting um, uh, because I, I Bizarrely enough, a, a friend of mine, uh, Steve, had suggested I go and talk to Canonical um, and meet Mark, and because uh, I was looking for work, and so I, I turned up at Canonical and uh, um, I met Mark, and Mark said, "Ah, oh, Steve says you're a great designer," and I went, "Well, that's great. I know nothing about design," and it was like, "Ah," oh. so we sat there for a few minutes. What are we going to talk about then? I said, "I don't know." Uh, let's talk about I don't know, what's changing in the computer industry. He said, all right. And so I started drawing a map. And then Mark was like, oh, blah, blah. And we got a huge, we just went for ages on this. And I talked about the shift that was going from computer utility and all the rest of it and its impacts and et cetera. And he said, right, you should come and work with us. And so literally I started like next day or so. And it's quite funny when I, when I walked into uh, Canonical, um, People say, what are you here to do? I said, well, I'm going to take us into utility computing in the cloud. And I, I think about the first five, six or seven people said, oh, that's just a fad. That's just for startups. That will disappear. It was all really sort of like dismissive of it. But then so was most of the industry, massively dismissive of cloud. It's just like, yeah, uh, who's going to use that? It's a bookseller, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, um, so the first thing was... Um, uh, used it for was to to show people how things changed to get people to realize that you know we may have inertia and everything else we're focusing on different areas but these things are, are real and these changes are going to lead to new practices and uh, uh, new areas so the first thing was convincing or showing people what was different because it's quite funny when you're sitting there with uh, a person who's running engineering and they're saying cloud is a fad actually they ended up being involved in a cloud company later is great fun. But so the first thing was persuading people that it, it or showing people uh, why it mattered. The second thing was, because I ran the, uh, the, uh, the strategy for this stuff, was um, there's several things involved. One, targeting areas. So knowing that we're going to see a whole bunch of new practices appear. So we wanted to make sure that as companies were appearing with those new practices, they were building with Ubuntu which means throwing support and help at all those others who were working on that space because we wanted to capture that space. The second thing was making it easy as possible to use Ubuntu in the cloud. So we're going to focus on doing that. And that also means not interfering with the community. So it's quite funny when somebody else comes up with a better um, uh, uh, the, um, uh, Ubuntu. Uh, well, they, they put a... a uh, an image up of Ubuntu and it had become quite popular and then you get a lot of people internally oh well we've got to stop that no you absolutely don't you want to encourage the community as much as possible so so the first thing is knowing is getting everybody understanding where the industry is going secondly is knowing where to target where we need to focus where we need to put effort Th thirdly is knowing where we need to not interfere as in, if the community is supporting us, let them do so. Help them as much as possible. And then it's also about where we need to defocus, take effort away from, and where we need to message. So the messaging was quite fun because um, I, I'd, because uh, I, I'd been, I also not only mapped out ourselves in the industry, I'd mapped out our competitors. It was quite fun when I discovered that Red Hat. Um, salespeople were getting, um, they had satellites 
uh, it's a subscription service and they would get bonuses based upon this. And, um, and the point about that was that we could come out with messaging, which would say that security should be free in the cloud security because security updates is what you get for satellite. And if we say security should be free in the cloud, that means no one will want, everybody's going, why should I pay for security updates? And of course that's a potentially going to affect salespeople's bonuses. So it was great dropping all these little messages out there to get, you know, you could hear, I, I used to love this. I would hear Red Hat salespeople going, oh, that cloud is a fad and all the rest of it and blah, blah, blah. And it was just like, great, you know, turn them, give us as much open space as possible. So that's what I did. I helped help direct things. Cool. And what, what should Ubuntu be doing today? Oh, so I left, um, gosh, uh, that was 2010. Um, uh, we got into our position and uh, I, I, I left with a whole bunch of um, uh, plans uh, from, uh, I left a whole bunch of areas they could attack. And then I went back into research. So what should Ubuntu be doing today? Um, I don't know, I, I, I won't, uh, they're, they're good friends. And so I, I won't comment on that one. Okay. Could you explain a little bit on, on because on the book you talk about differential value and operational value? Gosh, interesting one. So. Um, one of the, um, uh, so when we think about how things evolve, um, I, I talk about the Genesis custom built product commodity. Okay. So what happens is a, si a single thing, um, it, it, like a virus, viruses diffuse in a population. And then over many, many waves of diffusion, they evolve as well. So things uh, evolve uh, from, in this case, our activities from Genesis to to, to, to more commodity. So commodity is when they are fit for purpose for that environment. Uh, and Genesis is more, you know, it's the first time we're learning, we're, we're, it's a new thing. So what happens is that competition in the early stages, uh, particularly around early stages of products is all about feature differentiation. So my product is better than your product, blah, blah, blah. But eventually uh, as it industrializes, feature differentiations should be become marginal, head towards zero. And it's, it's all about operational differentiation now. It's price, quality of service, those sorts of things. So um, when we talk about differentiation, there are two, two obviously different types, um, as in feature and as in operation. Does that answer your question? Yes. Good. Yep. And, and is that also... Is that related to the that pattern that happens when you have basically products at you know the product stage, right? So they're competing on on features, and yeah. then somebody commoditizes one of them, i.e., makes it one super easy to use, which ironically sometimes it means it's, it's less feature rich than all the other products, but yeah. has a much stronger user need and 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 ability, which basically means that the users will all adopt it, even though sometimes the product companies think. But well, nobody will use that because it has less features and less good than what we have. But it it's actually not... addresses a lot more of the user needs. Okay, so so uh, this is like, for example, when we ship with compute, we're going from sort of the product space, a highly enterprise class and feature rich, highly resilient, mm -hmm. to to more utility space where you've got huge volumes of good enough. And of yeah. course, as we've known for a long time, you can build highly resilient infrastructure from less resilient, less secure components. Um, and all that, we, we learned that in the 1970s, there's that famous paper, and I've just forgotten the name of it, can't believe I've forgotten the name of that paper. I'll have to look it up in a second. Um, so, so what you, you've got is you, you go from this world of, uh, you know, you're trying to make the super resilient, ever more feature rich thing to realize that actually you can use vast volumes of good enough and actually get a better result at a lower cost out of it as well. Yeah. And so well, you, Google showed that, right? Because Google built data centers out of you know commodity parts instead yeah. of mainframes. And then when a disk will fail, they'll just 
replace it or not, so leave it there. And eventually, I think they even found amazing ways of going around bad sectors. <laughs> they wrote software to use to ignore the bad sectors, leaving the disks in there. But you know, from a cost point of view and effectiveness and a deployment, it became so much more effective. Well, you, you're now, and you know, if you are running data centers, you know, you're working on the basis, I assume, that at, at the minimum of the rack. So, yeah. you know, worrying about individual machines. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> I, guess. I mean, I, I would imagine it's at minimum a rack, if not much, much larger now. I yeah. mean, uh, and, and you're, you're, well, that, that's how it was almost 10 years ago. So, you know, you fill a rack you'd have a rack come in, which was all pre-built with all your machines and everything else in there. Yeah. And you work on the base of the rack. And once enough of the rack is dead, you just take away the rack and get a new rack. Yeah. Uh, pre-built and everything else. Yeah. But there we are. So can I, can I go back a little bit to Fortango, right? So I have a question. Oh, oh you're dragging this, right? back through memory <laughs> 15 so, years ago. <laughs> so, so, what, so you were already mapping when you were there for Tango, right? Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. So, in hindsight, right, yeah. in the maps that you've seen, should, because, 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 so basically, I'm assuming that in your map on that fateful day, and I don't know the whole history, I just know some of it, right? But I think on that fateful day where we're supposed to do the keynote, you were going to open source that platform. Oh, gosh, correct? the whole Zinke, right. Yeah. So, yeah, now, yeah, yeah. My question is, yeah. in the mapping and, yeah. and seeing the climatic patterns of what you were in the middle of, yeah. should have you open sourced that six months or a year earlier? Oh, no, yeah, no, I totally understand. So um, I was using the mapping heavily at Patango and there were three things that we were concentrating on by the end. 3D printing, use of mobile phones as cameras and uh, uh, what well, we'd started to look at that particular space. And um, uh, obviously our, um, well, what you would now call serverless environment, um, Zimki, which was a platform as a service, uh, but it had billing per function, uh, it was JavaScript front and back end, all that sort of capability. It was built on our virtualized uh, uh, infrastructure, which was provided through APIs as well, called the Borg, and we had all of that stuff. Now, the company itself, we had various constraints from the board. We had to be profitable all the time, which of course makes investment difficult, etc. So we'd become very frugal, very efficient ways of doing things. Anyway, the plan was um, uh, we were open sourcing all this stuff. We wanted to create a competitive market of multiple serverless providers because we'd already demonstrated the ability to uh, to flip between different what we call Zimki nodes. And so uh, there was a much larger advantage for us if we could get other people uh, to provide the underlying infrastructure to build on top to creating a competitive market. Because I'm looking at ways of uh, maximizing our opportunity given various constraints that uh, we had from the parent company, such as you no know, hiring people, which like is great if you're 10,000 people uh, uh, because you've got spares and it's not great if you're much smaller. Um, uh, the parent company like these sort of, uh, you know, wide announcements across all the different businesses. Um, so anyway, so that was the plan and everything else. That's where we were. And a key part of that was open sourcing it as well. Um, now, unfortunately, in those days, I didn't map political capital. Uh, and things like that. So I hadn't realized some of the other things that were going on. So one of the other things that was going on was this great plan had come up in the parent company. The idea was we should do a, we should outsource all of this stuff to one of these outsource providers because they know what they're doing or technology wise or whatever. Um, or they, they've been sold into whatever, believing this. And we should shut these research groups down, uh, even though we were a company. And so I was given a, told, you know, we don't want you to open source it. We want to look at closing it down. You'll get a nice little job in the parent company. And I was like, yeah, like hell. And so I decided to go. Because <laughs> I'm not going to sit there and tell a whole bunch of people, uh, yeah, your stuff you're doing is great, but you know, we're going to shut it down anyway, and then go off and uh, uh, have a cushy little number. You know, I'm, I'm not going to do that sort of stuff. So I just resigned. And so I was doing a keynote, which was all about open sourcing, and the board said, "Don't open source it." Damn it! All right, fair enough. 
Okay, I'll change my keynote then. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. Good stuff. Can I ask you a question on what's your definition of serverless? Since you talk so much about serverless, can I get your definition of serverless? Uh, well, well, okay, there's a lot of difference between serverless and serverless architecture. Okay, so when we're talking about serverless, where we're really talking about how the runtime itself has gone from very much uh, a product like lamp.net to more of a utility, say things like Lambda. Now with this and the whole serverless architecture comes a whole bunch of other things. So uh, there is no, not only the ability just simply to write code and billing for function and the whole event driven architecture, which is a part of that as well. There's also the wider set of services. Um, and some of those are more or less serverless than others. So ideally in the serverless, it all should scale down to zero uh, and or should just go up according to use as well. So, so what, normally people, when they're talking about their systems, they're talking about their you know, serverless architecture. And so they will have elements of serverless in there and elements slightly less serverless. Uh, but when I'm, if you're just purely talking on the whole serverless space, think of runtime as a utility. So it's all about code, it's all about events, and it's all about things like billing for function. Uh, and everything else is just below that. So if somebody says, hey, containers, that's serverless. No, it's not, way too low level. Um, code at the, at, is the lowest level. Yes, but, but that, 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 you're that's gonna give, from the... You're going to give me an argument here about Kubernetes and why, why it's got a... <laughs> well, no, no, I want to understand where you draw the line, right? Because, okay. cause, cause for, so for example, right, the serverless, so the first thing is, right? Like when, when we talk about, you know, scale to zero, you could say that this, the serverless functions, the uh, environments that we have today, right? AWS, Lambda, um, you know, zero functions, Google, scale Google to functions, zero. right? They scale to zero, mostly. so they get that, right? Mostly, correct. But one of the things they don't do is that they, they preserve state between the sessions. Okay. So, so basically what it means, it means that if you make five requests in sequence yeah. to a serverless function, right? Hmm. That means that the state that you leave behind on each of those functions is still there, mm -hmm. right? Today. Now that's a limitation on the implementation of those serverless functions because they use processes to gain speed. So what happens is Azure, for example, the way they do serverless is they start a process and they pause the process and then they start a process again on the next request, which is why they, they talk about the cold call versus hot start, right? And that's how they get milliseconds or, or, or 10, 20 milliseconds start of the next function because all they have to do is restart a process, right? Wake in a process that's already in memory. The problem with that is now you get state. So for example, in our case, right? We process malicious files. So I don't want state. I cannot trust a, 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 an environment after the execution of, of that environment, after the processing of mm -hmm. that environment, right? So I need to create a serverless environment for the development of the application where yes, developers are coding in that serverless environment, but I need in a way that environment to be unique every time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So if you achieve that and you can still scroll down to zero, that environment is still serverless, right? And so the a, point being, in a, uh, in I, I, a feel, Kubernetes I feel world, you're leading me to a in a, in a in a Kubernetes <laughs> world. Well, well, put it away. Right. Let's, so anyway, let's right? get back to uh, let's get back to sharing on some slides and something interesting. <laughs> Well, look, oh, the, 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 are, are we really going to do this? The, the whole sort of like Kubernetes. So, you know, Kubernetes and that whole stuff. If you go from the runtime downwards, okay, so yeah. under the run, runtime, you've got, for example, uh, the operating system. And then you've got the virtualized environment, which is underneath that, which, which, which might be, you know, you know, a virtual machine running on some hardware. It might be an infrastructure as a service environment. It might be your Kubernetes cluster, whatever it happens to be providing containers for you to run in. Okay. And, um, all of those things as they industrialize will are now new sets of practices. And it's the new sets of practices, which really cement the change. 
So with infrastructure as a service, it was DevOps. I know everybody keeps on going, well, DevOps is culture and blah, 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 and all the rest of it. Look, DevOps and infrastructure as a service are tied together, and it was the infrastructure as a service is cemented because of those new practices of distributed systems designed for failure, chaos engines which, which appeared. In this serverless space, it's those new practices, all to do with monitoring capital flow, refactoring, suddenly having financial value and everything else, which will cement this stuff in place. And everything below that line is just going to become less visible. And I'm afraid that includes, you know, operating system, uh, virtualized environment, Kubernetes clusters. Great. It's all good stuff. Um, but it will disappear. As in, it will be there, but it just won't be visible. And the chances yeah. are that AWS, in the same way that EC2 has ended up on chip, you can bet your bottom dollar that Lambda will end up on chip as well. I don't think, look, I, I agree with that, right? And I think on the evolution, right? It, it, in fact, I would say that what we're trying to do from, from the architecture we're building is to future-proof us so that when that occurs, right, we can embrace it. But, uh, but, so, but what do you do? Okay, so I completely agree that we should be using Lambda or serverless environments if it worked. But what happens when it doesn't? What happens when it's not fit for purpose for the scenario you have today, right? So what happens when at the moment we can't use serverless functions as they implemented today? Now, if they did what we needed to do, absolutely, I would use them, right? Because of course, the more, so so we had this debate. In fact, you know, Stephen and, J and James Duncan work with us, right? So we had this debate, right? So in one of the debates we had initially was, let's use AKS, right? Because, hey, that's managed service by AWS, really cool. It also doesn't work. They had to put limitations in their platform. We end up fighting AKS because it doesn't actually deliver the level of performance, the level of stability, the level of, 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 of basically speed that you need. Now, I'm, you know, so this is where I do the map. I says, of course, I, would, I wanna use the more commoditized solution, but what happens when today we don't have that, right? So, so okay, so, so my answer, right, is what you do is you build two things. You, you basically, you, you build a product that simulates that, but you put your application on top of that product so that when you design for future, so when the industry moves away, the platform, you just move with it, right? But, but today we can't use, we, we know that we have a product, we, we need a solution that the market doesn't have today. Okay, so Mike, so there is nothing, absolutely nothing wrong, okay, with saying that the system at the moment um, in that more utility form runtime doesn't yet provide what we need mm -hmm. and therefore we're going to have to use some other no drop down the stack a little bit and use something lower down the stack nothing wrong with that except for as long as it genuinely doesn't because most of the time when people say that they're looking for reasons why it doesn't so they can use the thing that they actually want because they have inertia mm -hmm. to the change so rather than doing this you know it, it's like it's like this um this lovely story that's told that you know oh you can have the future just like the past oh you can take your enterprisey stuff into the cloud and you don't have to re-architect it and you get all the benefits of the cloud which is completely complete nonsense yeah, of course. because the benefits come from the new practices and re-architecting yeah. the system so you you don't get but there's always this sort of like oh we will we'll make the migration costs almost invisible and you'll get all the benefits of the cloud at no yeah. cost total gibberish okay yeah. but people sell that so i understand i'm just highly skeptical um and when people say to me oh we can't use that because of limitations and other bits and pieces um, I take a skeptical position because they might be right and that might change over time. Yeah. But often when we sit down, we start going through in detail, then they start going, well, you can't do this, can't do this, can't do this. And it turns out there's different ways of re-architecting for that world. So um, I'm not going to disagree because I don't know the details. And, um, and if you and James and... Uh, uh, Steve have gone through it in detail. Okay, um, and there may be a good reason, but my warning flag is always um, just be careful uh, because of the tendency of our pre-existing past success, our existing physical capital, to encourage us to find ways of not 
just something. Uh, but I, I would say I use maps to make that decision, right? Okay. Yeah. And 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 it isn't like the pattern to plan for future up, you know, evolution, right? So I would say. Yeah. The model here should be, in fact, I try to think that everywhere. I try to think everywhere we have a component, that component should be thinking or it should be taking into account that the nail down in the future will be commoditized. Actually, we might even commoditize ourselves right? because you know some of the things we're doing is actually doing that, right? You know, We are making some functionality available and now suddenly what was very complicated before becomes super easy. So you get that co-evolution of practices, right? So if you design, your architecture so that the, the the higher level components can be replaced or can use you know the lower level components as they move to the right then you you benefit from having a solution that works today but also I, be future proof and it actually becomes cheaper in the future right more I, efficient I, I totally yeah i i do do understand uh it's just uh obviously i've been seeing the bbc going service and of course i know friends of mine who have you know, big companies in both finance and insurance who are all pushing all serverless. I'll be able to say say to them, that, that, that Dennis chat, that glass wall, we can't do what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, Sorry, I, I, there we are. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> I, I push you a little, it, the reason why I'm teasing. And, no, and that's fine. And I will have data to share. And, and actually, it's interesting because we actually want to talk to, to, to Microsoft and Azure and, and, and AWS and say, look, here are the gaps we're finding, right? Like the, it, it's interesting because the pattern that we have, which is one pod per file, does introduce a lot of curveballs, right? But actually, but what's interesting is that it actually forced us for a design where yeah. we can actually have the pods running in multiple clouds in multiple places. Because actually the design pattern that we're going is almost by saying the Kubernetes cluster or, or the environment is the app. The whole thing is the app, right? And, uh, and actually the thing, I was actually one question I had for you here is that Microsoft got a lot of stick in the past for the whole, wait, I got, I got the quote here, right? What was it? Um, the in, extend and embrace, right? Practices that they did. Right. And, and yeah, you know, but I think if you look at a lot of the cloud providers, they're doing the same thing, right? They I lock you in, they lock you in very, very fast in, in, in that world where actually, oh. you know, in a way, you know, although you might be looking at a commodity, you actually have a practice or you have a lock in, which is actually very hard to get, you know, get, get rid of. Right. And actually introduces other problems. Like we have outages caused by problems in the platform because when you want to build something super efficient i, I, I right? totally understand because i i have the these concerns i have these companies who say look we're an oracle shop we're very worried about getting locked into amazon or we're a microsoft shop we're very worried about getting locked into amazon and then i go so you've never been locked into before and it's like no we're an oracle shop and yeah. um so i hear this stuff all okay. the time uh, for those terms, guys it's like no no, yeah, no, no it's, it's not because portability yeah. and the i the first and most important thing, uh, you know, is is speed, efficiency, and new value. Oh, sorry, three. It's like the comfy cushions. The three, the four, most the three most important things <laughs> are speed, efficiency, and 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 access to new market value. Because if you're being incredibly slow, if you're being incredibly wasteful, if you're being, you know, you're not being able to build those new things that people want, uh, then you're going to be at a disadvantage both on a functional and an operational side. Um, so those, those are the top three. And then you've got the whole risk profile stuff about what happens if this vendor goes under, whatever it happens to be, what's our, what's our switching strategy, what, what are we going to do? So, so one of the issues, uh, well, there's several issues with that. <coughs> First, I'm um, exposed quite nicely by, um, by that horror that is COVID. Um, is, is our complete uh, lack of understanding of supply chains anyway. Um, it's been quite clear we don't understand our supply chain. So we've had this all this wonderful talk, but we actually don't understand the basics of our supply chains. Uh, the second issue is, you know, this is a uh, risk calculation. So there is a certain cost associated with using more and more different components. 
uh, as we um, add more complexity to the system because they're never truly identical. They might have semantic or syntactic interoperability, but you know, semantically they might work slightly differently. So it, it's, uh, there's always gonna be a, a level of increase of complexity of managing multiple, but that's okay. If you weigh off the balances of, you know, what am I getting against this? Um, but I would start by first focusing on, you know, the speed efficiency access, access to new access to new values. And you, so you can actually make resilient systems by using multiple availability zones or whatever, you, you know, you, you don't even have to be in the same country. You can use multiple countries easily at the same time. And that, so that builds a lot of resilience. But now you're talking about, well, what happens if, you know, Microsoft goes to the wall? You know, I've built it all in Microsoft. What happens if they go to the wall? Well, I can't get over my office documents. I can't get my email, my cloud stuff. So what's my redundancy plan for that? Or what happens if I'm all in Amazon and Amazon goes to the wall? What's my redundancy plan? But now you're, you're way down the scale. Um, into, and you're now going to be adding more and more complexity uh, into the system. And so it's, it really is a cost benefit analysis. A lot of what I hear is actually people going, oh, I don't want to get locked into them because they just don't like the company or what, whoever it happens to be, or it's not their favorite choice, or they're trying to push, you know, uh, a particular message based upon past success, pre and uh, Yeah, but I think that's an excuse. Yeah, yeah. Like, come on, anybody who complains about being locked in in Amazon after being locked to Oracle, right? Like, it's like, yeah, but I know, <laughs> it's but like, it's the on, most common. Come on, it's not. I, I yeah, but that's, that, well, I said that's that an excuse, tell right? Me this, that's just go, an excuse, right? That's yeah. just and a cheap excuse, right? So, so a topic I, I want to see if you have any thoughts on it, right? Because the, the reason why worldly map it clicked for me, right, at such a profound level is that I found myself the same way that maybe a couple of years before I, I realized that. Uh, a decade before, I realized that most of what I was doing was graphs, right? Everywhere I, I saw graphs, right? I saw graphs in source code. I saw graphs how I was thinking. And then worldly maps gave me context to those map, to those graphs, right? The, the thing that I found myself doing and, and promoting when I'm coding and building systems is this idea that you should be commoditizing the code. So if you think about from a developer point of view, even, even as uh, when you look at the code that gets developed, I actually think there's a lot of thinking that, and maybe have you done any thinking on this, on applying the worldly maps concept or the commoditization of code, but also to code, to modules, right? Because I actually, one of the things I'm, I'm not sure I've heard you speak a lot about is, and I experienced this, is that the power of commoditizing your, your code blocks, right? That you do there is the fact that you gain a property that I have seen very rarely in software development products, which is the, the more you have, the faster you go. Right. So, so usually in software, the more you have, the slower you get. Right. Uh, but with, if you commoditize all the different blocks, uh, you keep shifting to the right. And then, you, you know, you use those blocks, you know, on the next ones and then they go up and up. You actually go faster and faster and faster. Absolutely. In your, speed. In your so, speed. So, so another big thing about serverless is the speed. Yes. One of those will be the CPAN equivalent, as we had in, uh, in Perl, the CPAN equivalent in the serverless space. So if I go back to Zimki, uh, I look at Zimki, what we are trying to do. Um, uh, one of the developers I had built an entire new form of wiki with client, uh, client side preview. And I can't remember how long it was. It was about 18 minutes or something uh, from concept to production live on the web. Mm -hmm. And this was back in 2005, 2006. Um, and the reason for this is that a lot of the code already existed elsewhere and, and modules you can just use. One of the big lies of object oriented design and code reuse, because it was a great idea, was there was no communication mechanism. So what actually happened is, well, how many times, if you think back during your life, how many times have you built some sort of user registration function? Have a guess. What would you say? How many times have you built user registration function with a Oh, you might, might develop. Yeah, oh, it's several, develop. three or four or five. Yeah, yeah. Six or seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, I've I, 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 20. Uh, so if we get a thousand developers, we probably, I don't know, about 15,000 times uh, yeah. rebuilt the same thing. Yeah. Um, and so when you actually look at a code base, uh, generally, you, you know, it's difficult to know what the estimate is, but you, most of the time, I would probably say 90, 95% of the code, possibly even more, has already been built. 
by yep. somebody else and we're just rebuilding the same things over and over again because we lack the communication mechanism to do this so if you think about an environment such as a serverless environment which is basically a uh, runtime is a utility if you start having then other services and of course uh, we'll, then we'll go back we can go through the whole ilc model of amazon is monitoring usage of different functions by looking at metadata as in the consumption of their services not your data that's your data okay. there is their data they look at um that should help them identify what are those common functions and being able to provide those as standard services standard modules yeah. um and that will accelerate the process so the answer is uh, have i used mapping i've actually got an example of doing a um building a, a, a online hailing taxi app as a map with different functions and everything else yeah. and it, it's the same thing uh, a lot of the stuff we're custom building which actually is a commodity and, and we, we do a lot of this stuff and it hangs around so people talk about legacy I, I love this when they talk about legacy IT because mostly what we mean by legacy is custom built code which became a commodity long ago and we're still hanging on to custom built code that's what we normally mean by legacy I don't know why we call it legacy we should call it toxic because that's what it is but, but how do you measure that, right? So I think what, what's interesting is that, for example, I think speed is an interesting one, right? Because you yeah. could say the difference between this team and that team or this product and that product, it's almost how fast can you develop changes? How So I, I almost got there in security where I realized that the ability to push security fixes was directly correlated with the maturity of the product was directly correlated with the the continuous deployment pipeline almost directly correlated to their ability to understand what was going on like nobody doesn't want to fix things right you know nobody doesn't want to patch the problem is you know systems that are highly coupled or they don't fully understand or very hard to change they became you know solidified right and then they can't evolve so um, one of the big problems there is refactoring. Uh, and yeah. I'll tell you why that's a big problem, because you sit there and say, we need to refactor this code because it's bloody awful. It's got, uh, and people go, yeah, well, what, where's the benefit? And you, 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 now you're into the world of saying, well, it'll run faster. It'll, it'll um, uh, be more secure. It'll be, but it's really intangible. Okay. Or most of the time it's intangible, which is why refactoring gets always pushed to the back of the line compared to things like marketing. Marketing, that brings us users and users we can directly associate value with. Yeah. So one of the beauties about the runtime becoming a utility with serverless AWS Lambda, and people really did, don't crock this yet, is, is um, billing per function. Because all of a sudden, refactoring can be shown yeah. to have direct financial value. So I have this insurance company there sitting there and they're, they're going, well, it's, you know, they, they change functions and they can see how much money that saves us. So suddenly your investment choices and decisions are very different. Hey, marketing costs us this and will bring us this users, which we estimate will give us this value. Or refactoring this piece of code will save us this amount of money. And so all of a sudden we start being, you know, your investment approaches, changes and everything else and refactoring has financial value. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of the problems of the past have been just, it always gets pushed to the back of the queue because, you know, as you say, no one can measure it. Yeah, That's another reason for using service. Or, or unit, don't... right? <laughs> yeah. So unit, right? So if you can, if I say, here's a unit, right? And this unit runs code, runs something, can yeah. scale to zero, can be, you know, can you spin up a lot of them? I can, I can build per unit. Spin up. I, I, I'm, I feel you're going to try and look. If, if I've got a choice <laughs> of where I'm going to focus effort, it's going to be at the runtime and above as much as possible. I will go hmm. below the runtime uh, only if I really, really, really have to. Um, but, but the runtime and above, and it comes with my billing per function. It, gives me yeah. that sort of refactoring of code and everything else so so um yeah money is a great way yeah of, of measuring so i'll say billing per pod billing per, i i i i feel i'm <laughs> you're trying to drag me lower 
<laughs> my, but, focus, but, but, but actually, my focus is, you know, if I've got limited amount of people, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be saying let's go and build our own power system because or whatever, or let's go and build our own racks or let's go and build our own Kubernetes cluster or whatever it happens to be. I'm going to be avoiding doing all of those things as much as possible. I'm going to be focused as close to the users as possible, which means my natural starting point will be something like um, Lambda, serverless, as much as possible, except where there are limitations. I understand that. Uh, and my natural tendency is when people say it can't do something is to go, well, shall we have another look at it and see if there's a different way? Yeah. Um, but only if we yeah. genuinely cannot change something and everything else, am I going to start dropping below that line? So to get an idea that the way we approach this is we actually started a number of probably four or five pioneer projects, which ironically have duplication because they were all trying to do the same thing, right? But they were actually exploring the state of the art today of the technology. So we actually did Kubernetes, we did Knative, we did AKS, we did a bunch of them, right? So, and actually the reason I did that was to say, I want to understand where, where they are. And almost I measure the attrition point. I measure where they start to get stuck, the point of diminishing returns to tell me where almost the state of the industry is today. And now this leads me to the next question I want to ask you, <laughs> which is one of, one of the patterns I found, and I know that we, we've gone around a little bit in the past, but I just want to see, maybe I can explain it a bit better today, is I found that there's different types of maps, right? So there's a map that shows where things are today in industry, right? Which actually is quite good because you could see where things are. So yeah, absolutely. You could say that Kubernetes or Rancher or these technologies are to the left of serverless. Right. In fact, Kubernetes in your data center is to the left of Kubernetes in my. In, no, 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 in, in, no, in no, oh, no, 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 no. They're not to the left. They're below. Well, but, but below. But, below. Um, yeah, to the left and below. Yes, they're below. Yes, but to the left, they are a product that well, has been commoditized. Uh, okay, so what you've got is uh, virtualization. Is you know, it's highly should be treated as highly industrialized. It's standard, you know, Zen, yeah. etc. With Docker and all the rest of it as well, containers, that space is, is mostly commodity. And there's orchestration tools around that space as well. Mm -hmm. So management of your clusters and everything else, and that's sort of getting, you know, mid, late product. But they're all lower down the end of the yeah. stack, okay? Yeah. Whereas the runtime's been around for quite some time, but it's been products, LAMP, .NET, whatever it happens to be, is now moving into a more utility. Um, so I, I can bring up a map and we can talk about it if you wish, but um, uh, the, um, so yeah, well, yes, I, 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 I haven't got to my, my, my question, yes. But that's, yes. I would say that's the map of the state of the industry. Yeah. Right, and, and, and items will fall in that map, right? You know, depending on where we are in the industry, they will fall more to the left, more to the right, more up, more down, et cetera, right? Now, when we start using those patterns in the company, what we what we did, and actually, you know, this this by the way, this was a point of big debate between me, Steve, and, and James, right? But what I found was says that map, if I'm if I'm have five teams working on it, that map today doesn't help me. It doesn't help the teams, it doesn't help me to measure progress. What I need is to measure where those teams are in the uses of that. So let's say take serverless a good example. Serverless, you can argue that is all the way to the right in commodity. But if a team is using a serverless and they never use it before, if the practice of serverless is low in that team, then I need to map serverless almost at genesis or custom build or very immature to the left. Okay, I, I, I understand where you're going. And the, the part of the problem is that we're using stories here and stories are pretty poor ways of communicating as far as I'm concerned. So, so I'm going to just go, here's a map. All right. Yeah. So at the top, user application, best coding practice on a runtime, run operating system, best architectural practice, computer's a product, uh, computer's gone to a utility, you've got DevOps, operating system, runtime, et cetera, et cetera. So what we've got, serverless is the runtime shifting, uh, basically from the product space, LAMP.net to more utility space. And it comes with a whole bunch of things like billing for function and everything else. And on top of that, we have emerging practice Okay, so we're still learning about the practices of how to build things with serverless. And on top of that, we're getting new needs, new things being built as a result also of serverless. It enables us to do things we weren't able to do beforehand. Now, 
what you're saying to me is like serverless is over here more, you know, uh, all, all it is is the runtime becoming more of a utility. There's a wider issue in terms of serverless architecture. So you've got the whole event driven paradigm, which is not particularly new. Uh, you've got the coding environment and you've got all the services, some of which are more or less serverless. Some of them don't go all the way down to zero, for example. Um, and so you've got that associated with that serverless term and you've got the new practices that are appearing. Now, if you are unfamiliar with serverless, um, it doesn't make it, it makes, yes, it means, you know, it is new, I suppose, to you. You may be unfamiliar with a kettle. Uh, I've never seen a kettle before, I've never used one. It doesn't make a kettle suddenly genesis as a, a way of heating water. Um, uh, it's, uh, a kettle is still a kettle, some runtime is still a runtime. Uh, it's provided as a utility. We just need to, to um, it doesn't change that. It's just what it is. Um, now, in terms of the practices, I agree, they're still in the emer emerging space, we're still learning, in much the same way that DevOps was. Uh, some, uh, if you went back to 2010, uh, we were still learning about it. So if you are going to invest and focus, well, obviously, um, what you want to do is focus on those bits as close to the user as possible. And... Um, uh, the stuff underneath it. You yeah, but, 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 but my question is a bit different, right? I'm saying I have five teams that are yeah. working, right? And I want to measure. In fact, I want to show them, right? The 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 point, like the, what they're doing, is to move this problem from here to there, right? So we we know we have we need to figure out how to do this, right? Like a, a good example, like we we need to figure out how to run um, the engine in a serverless you know, uh, billing, you know, billing by the function, disposable environment, right? Or uh, that environment. So we need a way to, you know, and it is like, it's actually a problem that I had in, in the past, you know, imagine even just Im image compression, right? I, I remember once we popped the data center because we basically found a vulnerability in one of the parsing libraries that was compressing images, right? And mm -hmm. then it was, you know, game over after that, right? So it's a very common problem, right? Image reduction, compression, adding metadata. It's a very common job problem, well, well, right? You were, you were Photobox, I was Fatanga. No, yeah. no, I wasn't Photobox at the time. This was a different company. Oh, okay, um, fine, fair enough. So but, um, I understand the problem space. But um, um, but it was the same thing. It was actually, it was actually a really cool exploit. But um, it was on a buffer overflow of an uh, image parsing library, right? But it was basically it's still a common problem, right? Like you you have something coming through, you need to do some processing, and then it goes, it continues on the other side. Mm -hmm. In our side, because of the work that we do at Glasswall and its malicious files, from a security point of view, I really want a pristine environment every time. Right. I don't want to trust. I don't want to have to care about cleaning up the thing and detecting all that stuff. So, so, so the, the question here is that you have multiple teams looking at that. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, what I would say is that depending on where the maturity right of that team is in terms of understanding the platforms that they're working on. Right. Um, it um, it actually in fact, it allowed me, for example, to say. The team that today, the, the practice of ser serverless is really high should be the team that tries to tackle that problem in a service environment. But I'm not going to give that problem to the team that doesn't fully understand the cloud. Now, a team that maybe doesn't fully understand the cloud, but is actually really good at, let's say, Linux and really good at, you know, Kubernetes, for example, or really I good see. at other practices actually i do want to give them the other part of the problem which is hey figure out how to do that and, and in some of these i was able to say look for example we wanted to use rancher but rancher today is immaturity here but i say part of your job in gotcha. this project is to move it to the left to the right, right. and now so, i can measure it so so now I, well i think i've got you uh, except for that you just threw the measurement bit in there and i'm going to ask well okay uh, what are you actually measuring but before we get there um, something else you said is that, you know, the team who understands this stuff could do the serverless. The team who doesn't understand this stuff can do the, uh, uh, the lower end system. So if I look at the map, which I'm still showing you, and I'm telling you that uh, the stuff behind those inertia barriers is eventually, you know, it takes a long time. Uh, you know, it can take uh, 20, 30 years before this stuff becomes, you know, dominant in the market, etc. Well, it, it normally takes um, between 15, 20 years before 
before it becomes the new norm, but the laggards still hang around for quite some time. I mean, the last punch card system in London, I think was 2012, that was only eight years ago. So, um, you know, this stuff can hang around for a long time. But the problem here is if you're saying, oh, well, you're good at this low level stuff, you get to concentrate in that area. Um, you're not giving much of a future path to people, are you? Well, okay, by the way, th this was two week sprints, right? Of oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got to be careful. I know, I know, I know. The, you're all all that's going to happen is those people, you're going to concentrate inertia within those people because, you know, you're saying you're concentrating in this space down here. Uh, these people over here are going to do this higher stuff, but you're good at this lower stuff, so you're doing it. Um, but the problem is they'll hear the message that this lower stuff is going away, so they'll have all the inertia because they're being stuck down there. They're being told they're down there that, uh, you know, it's going away. Well, of course, they don't want it to go away, so they're going to give you all the reasons why it isn't going because they're trying to protect their jobs. You've got to give people yeah, a but, path. But <laughs> okay, but if you look at this scenario, actually, I was measuring the outcome, right? The outcome is, can you, at scale, create this environment? And the irony was the serverless team couldn't. In fact, the AKS team also couldn't, right? And, 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 and I, but, but the, the, kind of the, the point I, I think I'm making here is that I, I, I was actually, and can I share one thing? Simon, can I now share a map? Yes, of Instead course of you here, can too. Right? Um, so, so, and by the way, I really would love to just, you know, if you could take a bit of a look about at this presentation that, uh, can you see the screen? Oh, you can, yeah. Just, so it's this quite is small, a, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is quite, this is actually a massive presentation wow. that, um, it's, you, that uh, okay. Simon did. I know, I know, I know. I was just showing Slow this down the slides. <laughs> so, <laughs> who, did, who did this? This was uh, um, Steve and Steve. James. They worked yeah, on yeah. it, right? And we worked on this together. So basically, so actually what you actually had here was, the, the first version, which what you, you have here, was this version of where we were just mapping, for example, when we did the custom build, right? So this is an ICAP protocol, right? So actually what you have was you actually have the main product being custom built on top of Docker, which basically delivered the user needs problem of, you know, I want to rebuild my files. So this is an interesting thing. From, from a user point of view, we want a commodity, right? So the point of this is literally a website that you browse that behind the scenes, Right. We, so the user just goes to a website, but behind the scenes, we actually are rewriting the URL and then we're sending the stuff to our engine. So this is a good example of the first version actually used almost like a custom build ICAP server, didn't scale, did a thing in memory. So this is the typical thing. Well, the, the thing of the, the, the file processing was done in here. The next version, what we've done was we, we start to talk about building at scale you know, what we actually want to do here. And actually in this particular example, the idea was we want the, the customer, which is let's say head of InfoSec, we want them to create tons of these websites, right? So we want to, so basically here we go, we call it GW proxy as a service. The reason I, I kind of map it like this, I say today that practice is really immature because it takes a lot of stuff to deploy, takes a lot of things to do that. So this is already the Kubernetes server, right? That you have here. So the point is to move this guy to the right. So, so for the customer can just create tons and tons of different websites, in this case, that are proxying the stuff that we're doing. And then what, what we map here was where, and, and the next one is starts to show, and you can't really fully see here, but I'll just walk you through it. So we start to map where the practices of some of these activities are. And then again, the job of the team is to move these things to the right and, and actually map, you know, everything, right? You know, and, and kind of get an understanding of, for example, in fact, I think on this one, um, um, Steve didn't do all, all the stuff that we were talking about because in, in, in my view, the not, we should also track the knowledge of a particular technology. So for example, in some of these teams, oops, um, can you see the annotation? Oh, you can, cool. So yeah. in some of these teams, what I would actually do is I would say that, for example, the knowledge of Kubernetes was actually lower. So we should track it here. Right. And um, and then but then, for example, the knowledge of Docker was quite good. So you can keep it there. But the, the power of, for example, when we talk about this is that okay. I can now look at multiple teams so, so, and, so, and then see their progress. So, well, OK, so here's a danger with progress. Don't get rid of that. Leave that as where it is. Yeah. OK, leave your marks on there as well. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so let's go annotate. I'm going to annotate with you. Yeah. I'll put red. So you put Kubernetes here, okay? And you'll say, 
your team and your knowledge and understanding should be over yeah. here is, is over here okay Today. so so you should mark it on the map as it there and draw a big fat red line and say we are here and the reason for this is pretty simple if you draw it over here and then somebody can say or oh, draw a line going forward in this direction and call that progress okay that's not progress that's you being behind so always draw it where it is but put a real big red line saying we are behind where we need to be yes and 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 i i agree with that right because what you're basically saying well, i have a but because actually when they started they were here right all right For example. so right? so you can say we're a long way behind yeah but so but the thing i would say is i, I actually think you need the two maps right so you need one map to show you where you can go but actually the map gets does get complicated very harder to read when when you have that because it means that you have a lot of these these ones here, you know the, you, basically you would have that for all of these the the, the point i was I, I feel for me clicked a lot in my head was when i realized that this line here right where it is is yeah. the moment of attrition right so that's so that is the moment yes but it also means that today, for example, right, it means that it becomes the journey. And, and I, this, I actually would like to measure this because, and actually we have some data already where I think it's interesting to measure, and I'm putting in green, how long it takes to get from here up to the point of, of attrition. And actually we should expect that it's not realistic for us to spend time further to the right, right? Does that make okay. sense? So, so it's almost like the team, we shouldn't be spending in, it's, it's worthwhile investing in a team and giving them knowledge to get to the point of attrition, which is in purple here. There is, we shouldn't be get, having, so we shouldn't be spending resources improving Kubernetes to the right, which is what you call progress because the industry will do that for us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, if there's competition in the industry, um, yeah. yes, it will. It yeah. will eventually drag it to more of a commodity. And, and yeah. to, to some extent, that's already happening. So you can yeah. use things like uh, EKS, EKS Anywhere, for example. Yeah. They yeah and, and it's already over there. Absolutely. Right. And that's, and actually, that's, uh, that's one of the, the things we had initially. But I have to say, Mike, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Simon, this, this kind of really clarify a lot of things in my head was, you know, when, and we actually create other maps. I don't, I, I want, I need, I need to drag it, but, where we, we actually map where the teams are, okay. right? And then tracking the evolution over time. When, and I would expect that evolution to be faster. In fact, I would say my testing team, when they started, they were here, they totally on the left. And now I got my testing team creating, you know, Dockerized, in fact, even in AWS, you know, scalable you okay. know, testing frameworks. So, they, so, that, so and that was I totally, I, I, do, I do understand, but a couple of things, one, uh, I tend to prefer to draw where things are and then draw where we are relative to where things are. I, if we're behind, not to put the thing as where we are, but where it is in the industry and draw red lines showing that we're behind. Now, in terms of timing and speed, there is no time uh, uh, with these maps other than the change of maps over time. I can tell you that on average, for something to appear here, to get to this point of industrialization here, mm -hmm. is on average 30 to 50 years. Okay, a little bit of evidence saying it's now sped, sped up to about 20 to 30, but on average it's about 30 to 50 years. Now there is a difference between something being here, okay, like here, and us being over here. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it doesn't take us 20 to 30 to 50 years to go yeah. through all the learning of industry. That can, uh, us can be much, much faster um, yes. because all the lessons are elsewhere. Um, so there is a difference between um, how long it takes for something to industrialize because of market action and us catching up because we're behind. Yes. Okay, Absolutely, good. Good, good, and, good. I, and I and I think that's the delta that I'm thinking. But actually, what I, and I and, and this is where I, I would say that although you know it's it's good to be able to show 
the um, the team where they need to go right which in your case is there right in in the more they and and, and i'm thinking this in, and by the way i'm thinking in terms of weeks and months intervals here i think it's very useful for them to see the, the progress over time you know as they move along so the example you know for uh, computing it's take what 30 50 years to go from compute from being uh, Z3 1943 so it's, it's, it's actually longer 60 years uh, 30 yeah. 50 years an average to a compute being a utility um, just because we are treating computers as a product doesn't mean we have to repeat all that learning uh, <laughs> as in but you know because those lessons have been learned so us changing can be very very quick um, so I yeah. agree with your point um, I how quick it will be I have no idea yeah, yeah. And I'm not even sure that, you know, they're, they're, I don't even know if there could be a general metric. There might be. Well, I, I actually think, you know, it'd be interesting to see. I, I want to publish more on this. Look, I'll give you an example. Like, I feel that we productize design inside the company, right? So we have a Slack channel that you can go and you say you can drop literally a squiggle, right? Or an idea or a half-baked PowerPoint. And a couple of days later, we use Upwork quite spectacularly. You know, we use massively Upwork for this. But we know we found a couple of designers. We have a couple of things. You get dropped if, if they and they get it on, you know, get it back. So basically now it's a service that is almost provided internally. So we went from design or just making sure something looks better to a, a pain and it was really Genesis to actually you just drop it here and then you get it something else, right? So, so I, I take the view that part of my job is to commoditize and productize everything that happens in the company so you make it you allow more things to occur you will make it you're making the business more efficiently and i think from a you know now from an engineering point of view and from a, a capability point of view that's what engineering should be doing and i actually think that coming from a security angle where the security if you look at modern security practices the security everybody in security today talks about being an enabler right they talk about security would only scale if security is not a blocker it allows the business to go you know in a safe way but you know you should allow the business to do what it wants to do i actually think that the rest of the industry the rest of the blocks in the company haven't catch up like, why doesn't the finance team gives me a modern finance model? Why doesn't the HR team gives me that? Why doesn't this, why don't you have a services almost driven architecture inside a company where each team is providing services to the others and view that as really the thing they need to do? I think security got there very natively in the last decade, because if we didn't get there, we couldn't do, you know, FA, right? So we almost were forced by our, you know, by the scale of what we do. But I, I, I like the fact that from an engineering point of view, I can now apply the same principles everywhere in the company, where I think mm -hmm. our job is to productize, to make all those things that we have in engineering, apply you know, the, the engineering practices to a lot of other business and parts of it, right? Which, which actually makes the business more effective. So I used to work for Spear, Leak and Keller, which was uh, uh, financial markets. Uh, so I was clerking and all the rest of it, doing the SFAs, blah. And so, when you've got um, uh, financial instruments, it's the same thing. Um, doesn't matter whether it's finance, whether it's HR, marketing. Um, those industrialize. Uh, we have standardized. You know, at, at one point there was the first ever interest rate swap. And eventually, they became a standardized contract. And of course, then we built more complex contracts on top of yeah. that as well same actually yeah. within the legal system uh you can map out yeah. the legal system you can map out ethical values you can map out knowledge it's the same repeating patterns over and over yep we have a question here from drucking so i just sorry let, let's bring it back so a question on aws what would be the set of gameplays that could be played against aws to be able to compete at least at the same level wow okay so um where you want your doctrine right and go it's, if it's not all red it's not all green <laughs> you don't you don't have a chance well, well, well doctrine is really important a uh, doctrine table in terms of adaptability the better your doctrine is the more able you are to adapt so somebody like netflix can happily survive and compete on top of uh, aws as long as it maintains its uh, its doctrine it's focused on the users and all those other components as well um, there are all sorts of gameplay. Yeah. So you've got the whole ILC model, which obviously, you know, that's written about in their 
um, they, they put it in that second book. It's 15 years old, that model. And um, if you want to counterplay it, what you have to do is you have to move up the stack uh, and, and basically capture the information sources there. So um, let me share some slides. Because actually the question, that was one of the questions I had for you, right? And uh, isn't it also related to also commoditize AWS themselves, right? So you build higher value systems on top of AWS, right? So you leverage them, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. So let me, let me share some slides and we'll quickly go through this. Do, 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 do. Um, see that? ILC? Yep, ILC. So very simply, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, ILC, uh, you take an existing product, you turn it into a utility, uh, expose it to others. So uh, you get those benefits of componentization effects, i.e. Um, others can more quickly and easily build on top, uh, build new things. And then what you do is the others act as your free research and development department. So you can look at metadata. You don't look at data because data is their data. You look at metadata, the consumption of your service. So yep. you come out with something like compute and people build on top. And there's, I don't know, 998 people doing kit and internet and their, their rate of consumption of your compute is not going up. And there's two people doing big data and the rate of consumption of your compute is going through the roof. You know, there's something interesting in big data. And then yep. you identify what's interesting. You come out with something, I don't know, we call it elastic map reduce just for, just for giggles. Uh, and then a whole bunch of people will cheer because you've now provided two component services so they can more quickly build more new things, except for the people you've just harvested, in which case they will go, oh, well, you've eaten my business model. Now, this is also, the, there's the whole embrace extend. You mentioned Microsoft and blah, embrace extend uh, beforehand. Um, this is, this is building discrete component services, but it's a similar thing, but it's in real time uh, as in mining metadata to spot future patterns. Now, this is what I wrote about 15 years ago. It was core to the whole Zimki plan. Um, uh, yep. The point, very simply, uh, you get everybody else to innovate for you. You mine the metadata, uh, so you leverage the ecosystem to spot future patterns and you've commoditized the component services. Yep. And um, so nobody can sit there doing their usual play of rent extracting because product vendors like to sit there rent extracting as much as possible because they get the in, everything industrialized from under them. And so now your rate of innovation, customer focus, efficiency all increase now simultaneously with the size of the ecosystems. Every year, you get more innovative, blah, blah, blah. And, and so what you're basically doing is just climbing up the stack, okay? So if you want to counter this sort of play, uh, well, there's several things uh, you can do. Um, when somebody makes uh, starts to build that ecosystem in the space, you can very quickly create a competitive ecosystem with semantic and syntactic interoperability. Okay, and the purpose, you do, the reason for doing the competitive ecosystem, is basically uh, you're saying. Um, uh, you're not getting locked in, you've got a competitive market against a single vendor, but you're providing giving semantic and syntactic interoperability. So you can, uh, you know, uh, all the things that built on top of there can build on top of you, etc. And then you're playing the game of trying to grab as fast as possible a bigger ecosystem. And you're playing the mining of the metadata within that competitive ecosystem and then moving up the stack. So that's one play that you can do. And that's basically what I told my friends to do at Rackspace with OpenStack in 2010, which it was, uh, this is before it launched, and I put them on at, uh, at OSCOM, uh, which is where they launched at the OSCOM Cloud Summit. And critical to this was mass investment as quick as possible, uh, syntactic and semantic interoperability with AWS, uh, the APIs, uh, make them the same. Um, and, and you'd ha have to get people piling huge amounts of money. Uh, I, that plan, I think, lasted uh, approximately a few hours. It was in the very evening of the launch party. Uh, people started coming up with this idea of differentiating on APIs. And it was like, well, you're going to create a collective prisoner dilemma. It's just going to be a mess. And so what did they do? They went and did that. They sucked all the oxygen out of the market. Great, loads of parties and everything else. Fantastic job. Uh, Amazon gets to run away with it. So daft. 
So you could have done it, yeah. they didn't. The second thing you can, can do is you can say, rather than attacking that space, I'm gonna move up, attack, not at the same level, because we can't attack at the same level, because we can't work together for whatever reason. We will keep on wanting to create collective prison dilemma. So we'll attack it a layer up. And what we'll do is try and capture that market and we'll build that market on top of their services. So that example uh, would be uh, the platform was a service play, Cloud Foundry, right. Get Cloud Foundry out there, get everybody building on top, build it on top of Amazon. Critical, because all you want Amazon to see is Cloud Foundry growing and you want to be capturing all the information on all the services and everything else. That's what you want to own. OK, so that's why I said to my friends at Cloud Foundry and blah, 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 and I partially did it and then got sucked into this whole container and sucked into building for enterprise. And and of course, then Amazon launches AWS Lambda. Uh, game over um so the answer is if you are fast quick coordinated and know where what you're doing you can attack at the same level as long as you don't give the competitor playing this game too much of a lead time if you've given them too much of a lead time they've got the bigger ecosystem the amount of money you need to pile up keeps on going up and up and up through the roof to the point that it gets impossible okay if you're not that quick, then you attack above the stack, but you build on top of them and you've got to quickly build an ecosystem on top and cut off their source of information before they move into that space as well. OK, uh, we've had two attempts, OpenStack, Cloud Foundry, both have failed. OK, uh, um, OpenStack failed because it just decided to go and differentiate on a APIs, clearly didn't know what it was doing. Cloud Foundry, James Waters knew what he was doing. Uh, I, I think there must have been some politics have got, gone on. But this whole sort of enterprise-y uh, container, uh, wrong focus. So um, there are ways you can play the game. Um, you've just got to be skilled. Yeah. Hey, and, 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 and the thing about that is that if you look at the latest moves for AWS with, with outposts and with, with bringing EKS back anywhere. Going, EKS anywhere, they're now going to eat the lunch, right, of, of the internal teams, right? It's like, okay. So, so, so here, here you are. I will tell the computer industry, okay, I'm going to give you one last chance, all right? If you want to have a future where you own it and it isn't just Alibaba and Amazon, conversational programming. There you are. Move up the stack. Attack that right now, build it on top of, you know, Lambda, et cetera. Uh, so and this is what Alexander Simovich has done. So take that, build it, build a market on conversational program, shift up the stack. I know you're going to say, oh, but, that, you know, inertia, inertia and blah, de blah and all the rest of it. But if you don't, they will. They'll own that space and bye-bye. Yeah. So, but... Okay, but if you are a company that today owns, you know, you know, is, is lower the stack. Like if you if you are the ISPs or the managed service providers, yeah. What what's your game plan? Do you pack in and give up, or no, you no, actually? No, no. No, okay, okay, okay. It's, it's really simple. And you know, if you're down low down the stack, okay. Yeah. Uh, suppose I'm lower down the stack and you're lower down the stack. So what I'm going to do is, a, first of all, I'm going to squeeze the company as much as possible and return as much capital to to shareholders in order to keep my you know dividends um, uh, share buybacks in order to keep my share price high okay and um, i'm going to try and raise cash and i'm going to acquire you who's down the bottom end of the stack and i'm going to smash us both together which means firing a load of people squeezing and everything else and return even more cash to the shareholders and share buybacks just to keep the share price going up and, and then I'm going to use that to raise more cash and more and keep on smashing and smashing and smashing and smashing until there's nowhere left to sh smash but hopefully by that point I'll have retired and then somebody else can come along and deal with it as it goes over the cliff <laughs> there you are, there's the plan there's the, there's the master plan good all right Simon this has been amazing <laughs> um we got, and I really want you to go back to those. So I think what we need to do is if you send me the, the titles of those other topics, we'll we'll schedule that in for the next summit. So you can actually start. Uh, I, I love this. You, you, you say, can you come along just for one? And before you yeah. know it, you jump on me. Oh, we're going to do these every month. Do you know what? 
I'm always oh, every other month if you want. Every other month. I'm every always other happy month. to talk to you. It's always a delight. Do you know we should get uh, Jamie Dobson or somebody like sure. that? Um, um, do you know Jamie? You tell me. No, I don't. You tell me who you want to invite and I'll go. Oh, well, well he, does it, he, he, he does this whole uh, podcast stuff as well. Uh, there's others. Sure. We, should, we should get a little group and uh, absolutely. we get people like Mr. Snowden and all that sort of stuff as well. I, absolutely. I, uh, um, yeah, all right. All of a sudden, we're going to create this ad hoc pop podcast. I, I think, um, I, so I'm delighted. It's always a pleasure uh, talking to you. You know it is. <laughs> no, I, I, look, I, I think that there's... I always learned a lot of stuff. I, st I had, I'm glad we were able to do the questions because I did, you know, I, I had them lined up and then, um, and I think it was, it was really good to be able to pick your brains on, on this and, uh, and the, the next, you know, the more advanced, but now I'm very curious about the other stuff you have on, on those, on those slides. Right. So, oh, well, you know, I mean, we can talk about digital sovereignty. We yes, can talk about exactly. organization. We can talk about doctrine. I mean, there's so many, we can talk about logic diagrams and maps, uh, getting yeah. started, industrialization, the practices that are new. There's so much. I mean, it's a it's yes, a huge but let's, keep let's keep talking. It's, it's, but, but it's a the huge thing I would, Yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. My, my apologies. The, the, the only thing I would say is that I feel that there there is there's a, a type of topics that it would be it would be quite quite amazing to, to hear your views on because I, I think you know. There's a lot, there's a lot of materials already, right? On you know the mapping part, right? I, like the topics you just talked about, there's not a lot of material. So I think it's 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 really good to see if we can get you to expand on those topics because they are fascinating, but also they are real world applications of mapping, right? And I think that's what will be interesting is to almost see how you are thinking about those things, having the foundation of mapping. That sounds fun. I'm more than happy to do. I tell you who else we should uh, see. We, we we'll have to do it later in the day. You should get uh, uh, people like Cat Sweetle. Uh, Cat, yeah. uh, absolutely fantastic. The whole ethics of care, um, you know, ethics of choice. We can go into that whole political debate as well. So um, absolutely, right. we should do something. We de definitely. I, it's been fun. Oh, but please, less on the serverless and the Kubernetes. Yes, that's, I, I'm, that's... I'm just going to say to people, look, use Fair serverless. Enough unless you really can't, okay? Yes. In which case, use what you have to um, until you can use serverless. And I keep yes. on going back to, when you say you can't use serverless, really, I, I'm gonna ask you that several times until you've demonstrated that. Well, I'm gonna publish data, and if I can, if we can be proved wrong, yeah, please show us. Yeah, yeah, but absolutely. Uh, if you can't re-architect to use it, but you know, that's where the focus should be. But there we are. On that and bombshell. Bombshell. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Pleasure. Uh, we'll, we'll, pu we'll publish the video in a, in a bit, and then we'll, we'll continue next month, other month after, Simon, is whenever you, you can. Uh, I'm always happy. So we'll do that. Take yeah, care. Uh, and I'll stop recording.